Hey everyone, in this week, we'll learn how to develop our project idea for a hard surface robot inspired by the natural world. We'll gather reference images and inspiration for our design. From there, we'll establish the basic shapes of our design and block out our robot to a first pass gray box. The homework assignment will focus on idea generation, reference gathering, and a block out model. Hey everyone, welcome back. So in this video, I wanted to cover how I actually start my project ideas and how I come up with the concept for what I'm gonna create for my personal work. So usually it will start in one of three ways. I'll either start with uh, concept art, uh, reference, or I'll um, generate my ideas from imagination. The idea for this particular project came a little bit from a combination of imagination and also looking back into my portfolio uh, for some of the work that I've created in the past. So I created a, a series of work using Substance Designer to create Substance Planets and I wanted to transform that idea into a slightly different project that was more prop focused. So that's how it started and then it developed once I got more reference and uh, concept art and other things as well. So usually when I'm starting a project, I'll start with what's called an art Bible, which we're going to go through in this session. So what is an art Bible and how is it useful? So in this particular case, what I use an art Bible for is defining the project idea, coming up with the reference and the overall mood of the project. It's something, it's a tool that's often used um, in studio environments to define the overall artistic vision of a project and work out all the elements of a game that you might be making visually. So that's what it's generally used for. It's really useful. I find it very useful. Um, if I'm going through the project, I can return back to the art Bible at any point. So if I get into the project later down the line and um, and sort of get an idea for where I, where I am and what my headspace was when I came up with the idea of the project. It's useful for setting the objectives and um, what you're gonna learn from the project and getting that down on paper really quickly. Uh, setting the style and the mood boards and the reference that you're gonna be using for the project. So that's how I find it useful. So the first thing I'll do in a project typically is define the goals for the project. So uh, in this case, this is split into what do I actually want to get out of the project? What am I aiming for? And then also the output. So in this case, on the left-hand side, this was a overview of what I was planning to achieve. So I wanted to basically make this into a personal project, which could potentially develop into more of a series similar to my Substance Planets and inspired by uh, the work I did before. I knew I wanted it to be a smaller prop focused portfolio asset. I wanted it to demonstrate good modeling techniques with complex shapes and forms. And I wanted the texturing to be realistic and have lots of detail. So that was the initial pitch for the project. I knew at this stage as well that it was likely to have some sort of animation focus and I wanted to capture that in videos of the asset actually transforming. I wanted to also have nice 2D screenshots which could show um, interesting detail in both collapsed and deployed forms. And then ultimately this would become a tutorial. So it was a CGMA class with feedback and Q&A. For the tutorial, the aim at the start here was to have a prop focus tutorial that would become a free YouTube series. And generally my objective was to give students something fun and exciting to work on, but also to appeal to different skill levels. That was the aim of this particular class. So after the goals are defined, I try to create a bit more of a specific breakout page where I'm talking about the ideas for the project. At this stage, I'll generally gather inspiration from 3D art and concept as well as reference. Um, usually this is just as a inspiration to try to get ideas down and um, I'll usually make a more detailed reference board later on. At this stage, um, I also just get my notes down here. I wanted the um, asset here to have two different forms. It would have a more simple primitive shape like a cube or a sphere, and then it would deploy from that shape into uh, the robot or the animal mech that you can see here. Um, at this stage as well, I l really like this idea of having an ecosystem contained within 
the actual prop itself as well. So I did this kind of idea with the substance planets before, but that was much more external on the outside of the planet, whereas this was definitely more of an internal idea. Um, I thought that it, it could be cute and fun and uh, based on nature and animals for to, gra to grab that real world reference. Otherwise, um, it can be difficult to relate these types of things unless you have real world reference. And so I was thinking very much about what would make this unique and cool at this stage. What is it going to um, sort of, how is it going to stand out? I knew I'd also have it rigged and animated um, for presentation as well. From this, I'll then start looking more into a mood board. And this is just to get the general feeling of the project idea across. You could also sketch out ideas as well if you find that's helpful. But uh, usually I'll tend to just start reference gathering uh, concept images and 3D reference and building Pinterest boards and just getting a general idea and feel across for the project I want to create. Next, I'll grab external references. So this can be uh, CG artists or concept artists for um, um, photographers and different artists that inspire you or have work that could be uh, really helpful when it comes to the type of project that you're trying to create. So I usually just grab a list of different artists and I'll save the links to their portfolios or I'll take a look at their work and use that to inspire my reference boards as well when I start building things later later on. I'll also have a think about movie and TV references so that can be films that inspire uh, different TV shows that you find helpful and then the same idea for games as well. So if there's particular video games that you've played, certain types of props that you see in those video games that can be useful. Um, that's all really helpful stuff that you can use as reference and inspiration when you're thinking about your project. Next, I'll start to think about the style of the project. So, um, so far it's been all about the idea and how I'm actually uh, thinking about what I'm gonna create. But next I like to break down uh, what is the style of the project? So is it stylized? Is it realistic? Um, general notes about things like the shape language and the silhouette. Um, that type of information. So in this case, I wanted everything to have this sort of soft Boolean shape feel where things are cut away from each other. I wanted to have pretty soft beveled curves. So you can see in some example uh, references here that we have really smooth shapes with large bevels. That was the idea I wanted to get across. I wanted the majority of the silhouette to feel pretty rounded, like you can see in these examples as well. Uh, generally, I would have sharp angles, but try to keep them smaller and not impact the profile of the silhouette too much. Try and have um, everything mostly flow together and soft shapes. And that definitely gives more of a retro feel and those forms being more circular and rounded definitely gives that sort of feeling, right? I'd also think about material definition and just the general uh, look to how I want this prop to feel. So at this stage, I knew I wanted things to be more stylistic in the silhouette, so more rounded shapes and things like that and have a particular style to it. But I generally wanted to have realistic material definition. So that could be uh, sharp sort of scratches and metal edge wear and dirt build up and things like that. I didn't want those to feel more hand painted or stylized. I wanted to get across the big, medium, small feeling. So uh, large shapes with small details um, always thinking about that hierarchy of uh, large to small details, making sure I'm covering that as far as my prop is concerned. And just generally having a good design language when it comes to uh, those types of details, making sure I reinforce the same details across different areas of the model. And here are some further examples. So this is a bit more of a another mood board that just shows some of those ideas with uh, some props and concept art. Uh, different 3D models and things of the type of look I wanted to go for. So again, this isn't being used as uh, actual direct reference when I'm modeling. This is purely just to get the idea and across. Uh, so I'm thinking about this as a inspiration. So I wouldn't be looking at this necessarily for reference, just mostly to communicate my ideas as far as the art Bible is concerned. And finally, I start to think about lighting and presentation. So when I've actually built out the model, how am I going to present this? How am I going to get this feeling across? So um, generally with prop models, I tend to present them in similar ways. And um, this is something that I just have built up over time and 
I got a sort of feel for how I wanted to present stuff. So in this case, I wanted a clean, simple presentation style like you can see here. A simple background, not too complicated in this particular case. Um, this is just for presenting the model itself. And then I would usually, for props, I would tend to lean towards a three-point lighting setup. So that would be uh, using the key light, the rim light, and the fill light, which we'll cover in more detail as we get into the, into the class. Um, and then uh, I would like to be able to just display the animations and renders in consistent lighting so everything feels like it's part of the same project, right? We don't have really dramatically different lighting and uh, renders and things like that. So that's the idea. And I wanted the shadows to feel uh, detailed and sharp, but also fade off to be soft at distance. So you get that sort of feeling in some of these renders where uh, depending on the light distance, you can see that the shadows would start to soften up the further away from the object that they are. And then I generally like to just have smooth gradients or colors in the background if I'm doing a simple presentation because the focus here is about the prop and showing off uh, the modeling and the texturing and not necessarily having um, a background that could be too distracting. And then I wanted to just m match the kind of cleanness that we're going to see in the actual presentations from CGMA as well. So that was just an idea of how I could make that all feel like it's part of the same sort of look. Hey everyone. So in this section, I wanted to go over my process for grabbing reference for the project. So in the last section, we went over the uh, art Bible, which is how we actually establish the type of project that we want to create and set the goals and some of the high level mood boards and that type of stuff. So in this section, I wanted to go over um, how I actually create the mood boards. And for this particular project, I actually had two mo main mood boards. I had one which was to figure out the type of mech I actually wanted to create because from the art bible um, I established I wanted to create an animal based mech but I wasn't 100% sure on what type of animal so that was the first thing I needed to establish with this idea board and then from there once I figured that idea out and which one I was going to choose then I would explore reference more and try to get things that are going to be helpful for me when I get into the modeling and texturing part of the actual process. So. Uh, this is the board that we're looking at here is the idea generation board. In this session, we're going to go over the detail here and some of the reference images I grabbed. But before we do that, I'm just going to talk about my process for grabbing reference here. So the first thing I'll usually do is grab reference off of different websites. So in this case, I'm using Pinterest. This is a, uh, a website where you can create boards of reference images. So you can search using the uh, pins and then pin stuff to your board. You can do that from other websites as well. So this is really helpful for just grabbing a bunch of reference for the type of project that you're going to do. So I would be searching for things like animal mech or animal robot, and then it will pull up lots of reference images and I can just pin those to the board and get a quick idea of the type of thing I want to do. So Pinterest is really helpful. Um, also use Google Images and Flickr and those types of websites just for searching for image searching basically. And the program that I pull all the references together is called PureRef. You go to the website here, pureref.com. And this is a free download. You can grab uh, reference images here and you can see drag and drop them into the board and arrange them like a mood board, which is really helpful for these types of projects. And then you can add notes and information to those as well. So there's a lot of stuff you can do, which is really helpful for reference gathering there. So definitely recommend PureRef as the main reference creation tool here. And then I'll also use websites like ArtStation uh, to grab 3D reference as well. Uh, usually that will come up as part of Pinterest as well. You tend to find that uh, you'll pin things from ArtStation as well. Um, so yeah, that's my usual process. And I'll just drag and drop references within to my Pinterest board and start to build up ideas here. So um, going back to the art Bible briefly, I wanted to create this animal-based mech with an ecosystem. So that was my high level objective. So these are a bunch of ideas. And the um, if you've seen the, the final images for the project, you'll know that I went for the beetle project here. But what I wanted to make clear is that if you're a beginner or you're somebody who might find um, a beetle a bit too complex to, to work with in to, as far as a prop is concerned, 
Um, I would also encourage you to establish more simple ideas. And I'm going to point out some ones that are, I, I would consider to be a little bit more simple. And I'll explain why as we go along. So, um, OK, so here's a bunch of different animals. And you can see I've got manta ray, turtles, um, wood lice, pangolins, crabs, frogs, um, insects such, such as wasps and bees and beetles and lizards. So these are a series of different ones I thought would be interesting to turn into a robot mech. So starting off with the manta ray um, and, and at this stage as well, I'm just being loose with the images. I don't really mind too much what the images are. I'm just trying to figure out what type of idea I want to go for. So I'm considering um, the shape of a manta ray in real life and how it could translate into a robot and finding examples of 3D stuff that already exists that does that or concept art as well. Um, and then I'm trying to think about what could the ecosystem be within the robot. So as far as the manta ray is concerned, I had a, a few different images here. You can see um, I, I often found as well that there'd be a lot of Lego um, models that actually were animal based. So you can see that in a few of my examples um, here where I actually find Lego um, reference. And this is really helpful for thinking about how things articulate and move and translate into being more robotic, right? So that's something I did find really helpful. As far as the manta ray is concerned, I would consider this to definitely be a slightly easier one to make if you're a beginner, mostly because um, you just have the body and the wings and the tail. So if you're thinking about parts that might potentially move, there's not a huge amount to worry about. You don't have to worry about limbs um, or wings or things like that that are a bit more complex. So this one is a really nice one if you wanted to do as a beginner. And here's a couple of ideas. In As far as an ecosystem was concerned, for this, I mostly was thinking about it being a, a tied to its actual environment. So that could be maybe underwater corals and fish and that kind of stuff could be a nice way to bring the ecosystem element into it for this particular case. Moving on to the turtle. Um, the reason I don't capture that is because the idea for the turtle is kind of similar as well. This is a sea creature. So um, again, have the same idea that it could have more of this coral type system inside, which could be really nice. Um, and then we have What's cool about the turtle is that it has the shell. So it has an obvious place for you to be able to put an ecosystem into it. And so I had this idea that uh, the only parts that would move in this one, it's a bit more complex than a manta ray because you do have the legs and the head, um, but you've only got four limbs and a head you need to worry about. The shell is mostly gonna stay pretty stationary because it's quite hard and, and sort of, um, it's not going to really deform or move very much. It's definitely like more of a solid shape. So that's something that I was thinking about with the, the ecosystem for the turtle here. And then I've got some some similar ideas. So with the uh, wood lass and the pangolin, these are very similar to each other. Um, I liked this because it could potentially roll up like they do in real life into a simple primitive, which was something I also called out um, in my art Bible. So if it was to roll into this sphere shape, that could be really cool. And then I had the idea that if it was a wood louse, it would have more of a forest floor style environment contained within the shell. So that could, again, be something really cool. Um, this one is a little bit more tricky to think about as far as like animation is concerned, because you have to get rid of elements like the legs and things and contain them within the shell. So, um, yeah, but there's a bunch of really nice ideas. And I just saw some really cool concepts for these types of things that I thought were great. And then for the pangolin, I didn't see that many examples of uh, concept or 3D art for pangolins, but I definitely found lots of real world reference for pangolins, obviously. Um, so this is a, a great example of that type of stuff, right? Then I thought about a crab. The, the reason I didn't think about doing a crab was because I'd already just made a project with a crab, so I wasn't considering that. But um, the crab idea is also really cool. This one is definitely more on the slightly more complex uh, many limbs. You've got eight legs, right? And then you also have the claws as well. And you've got to think about the body and the eyes. So there's a lot of stuff to move around and animate if you were going to go that far with the project, right? If you're just going to model it and you weren't going to animate or rig this, that wouldn't be too bad. But um, yeah, so there's just something to think about. Um, here is quite a nice example of how you could simplify it. It still is readable as a crab, but instead of eight limbs they've gone for four limbs and that 
um, still feels like a crab, but it just doesn't have as many legs to deal with. So I like that idea as well, maybe reducing the amount of legs, uh, but still making it readable is pretty cool. And then here are some examples for a frog. The, the frog is um, a really nice idea. I definitely like this one as well. Um, with the frog, you've got more um, limb stuff to deal with in terms of like the back legs definitely are a bit more complicated in the way that they bend and move. Um, and those are obviously used for the frog to sort of jump as well. So there's definitely a bit more complexity with that. But I love the idea of this one. Um, and frogs lend themselves quite nicely to being more simple shapes as well. So you can see some examples of concepts of that kind of thing here. Um, cool. So that's the frogs. Then I also, these ones are definitely more on the complex side. So I don't know, the wasp and the, the wasp um, or bee idea isn't super complex or it's less, maybe less complex than some of the other ones. But if you wanted it to roll up into a primitive shape, then it would start to get a bit more complicated like you can see here. Um, but in this case, you know, it's, it's a pretty nice idea. And I like the idea that the ecosystem for this one could be more of a... Uh, nectar style uh, in, in in its back basically with honey and that kind of stuff it could be kind of interesting to take those ideas um, and sort of relate the color schemes and everything there as well so that was what I had for the ecosystem for the ecosystem for the um, for the crab and the frog I think I missed that um, talking about those I would do something similar um, sort of underwater themed and then I also for the frog I was thinking more about the same idea I had here with the wood lice, more of a, a forest floor style ecosystem there. Maybe taking some frog spawn or something along those kind of lines, right? Then we obviously have the beetle. The beetle is um, nice because it has um, simple kind of limbs that are e fairly easy to, to sort of articulate and move. It does have some complexity like the wings and tendrils and things that um, relate to its head. So it definitely is more on the complicated side, right? And we have the a lizard idea as well. Lizard, um, I definitely felt was going to be really tricky to make into a simple shape. I love lizards. I think they're really interesting as, as creatures, but um, it was definitely going to be harder. So I would say um, this one is really cool if you were just doing a static model because you can definitely get some cool poses and really nice colors and uh, that type of stuff. So if you're just going to do a model and you're just going to pose it, I think that's great. That's a really nice example. If you had to animate this, it would be slightly more complicated, I think, especially with the tail and other elements, right? So, um, so yeah, so that's pretty much the idea board. So as you can see, at this stage, I was very loose. I'm just trying to think about uh, what type of animal do I want to create? Um, what, are my, what are my goals? Like my goals from the art Bible were to create an animal-based mech. And I wanted to have an ecosystem included in that. So I'm starting to just think about those ideas at this stage. I'm establishing what could be the theme of the project and how I could lean into uh, those different ideas, right? Then after I'd uh, figured out my ideas a little bit further, I started to actually build my final reference board for the beetle. That was the idea I selected and I, I went forward with. And I have more of a fleshed out final board, which is going to help me a lot with reference um, for when I'm actually modeling and starting to block out the model. So we're going to go over the different elements of this and we'll just sort of as a high level explain um, that what I'm thinking about and why I'm uh, collecting reference in these particular cases. So start over here. The first thing I, I generally would do here is try to get as much reference for real world beetles as I possibly could. Um, so in this case, I'm actually doing it by species because if you search for the different type of species, you can get a uh, much better reference for these types of things. So here you can see some examples of different beetles. I've got um, so things like the tortoise beetle, the leaf beetle, um, shafers and um, goliath beetle, Hercules beetle. So different types of beetle here. Um, so those are uh, really helpful for getting that super close up reference and seeing um, inspiration and things here as well. So you can see this is actually uh, the Hercules beetle is actually what I based uh, my concept on. So you can see here a bunch of really nice reference for that. Um, also um, at this stage I found um, some really good photographers as well that took really close up macro shots of insects and beetles. That was really helpful for um, establishing the sort of color palettes and, and those types of things as well. Um, the other thing I also did was I visited 
a natural history museum and got some books and things like that took some real world photos um, this type of thing I got a lot of real world reference for this where they actually preserve the beetles and um, then you can take photos of them so obviously trying to find more examples are, are really great for reference gathering so definitely if you're working on animals I would encourage um, taking a trip to, to museums if you can that's a really great place to go for that type of stuff and then I also um, I was establishing the ecosystem again so here I have this idea of um, the sort of the ecosystem that the the beetle would actually live in and then I'm thinking about my ideas and what I actually ended up going for in the end is working more into this idea of a beetle la larva where it's actually carrying smaller versions of the beetle in its back that was the ecosystem I went for in the end um, so yeah just establishing that idea there I also think about the anatomy as well try and find diagrams and images of that type of thing that can be super helpful when it comes to uh, thinking about how things are going to articulate and move. I also found some so sort of scientific papers as well about how things articulate and move as far as the legs of a beetle are concerned. What are the movement of those particular elements like? So that is really helpful when it comes to actually modeling and thinking about the movement of our of our asset, of our prop, right? And then as far as uh, the rest of the reference is concerned, I have a bunch of reference of uh, different 3D examples. A lot of this is really unrelated to beetles, but it can just be helpful to see examples of um, other animal mechs or, or sort of mechs in general. Just really helpful to see the types of details that you can get and some inspiration for uh, what I was creating there. And then this is definitely more of just concept related. So uh, you can see concepts for sort of more animal related mechs and just general ideas. A lot of this comes from the Pinterest as well here. So you can see that kind of idea. And then I had a section here for uh, just for Lego because I found these really helpful Lego models of beetles and lava as well. So again, this is incredibly helpful for how things are constructed and put together because if it's being put together in Lego, you definitely have to think about how things move and articulate, but also how the different sections of the of the beetle um, exist together. So how do the pieces um, snap together or how do they um, sit next to each other and that kind of thing. So that's very helpful for me when it comes to the modeling and the reference gathering as well. Um, and this section here, um, this is focused on a little bit more about the final objective. So in the, um, so go over to this section here, I have the PowerPoint of um, the art bible and so, so these are some of my initial ideas right this was what I was trying to establish with the project as far as um, the style of the model is going to um, what it's going to be and uh, what I'm trying to achieve with my goals and things like that right so here is uh, much more focused on what I'm going to deliver so in this case I'm trying to think about how I'm going to do the presentation um, what am I going to do for screenshots and that kind of thing so I find this is helpful just to plan it out a little bit um, and a lot of these images, some of these just don't relate at all to the final result, but they're helpful for me just to figure out what I'm going to do. So I knew, for example, I wanted to do um, some different some different screenshots. I'd have some on a more plain background, and this was the overall amount of shots I wanted to do and the type of style I wanted to go for. And then there's some examples of the type of thing I was aiming more towards visually in terms of presentation. And then I had this more complex scene where I have the flower and the beetle is posed on the flower. Um, so again, this was me thinking about, this is like a hero shot. So the, the most important screenshots are the ones that are being posed on top of the flower. Um, but I also had another idea, which maybe he could be posed on a log as well. That was another idea that I had. So I was thinking about the hero shots there, what are going to be the most important shots I'm establishing for the project. And then also my presentation for animation as well right so that's what i was thinking there and then this just gives like a very a, a really quick snapshot overview of the project like i'm going to make a robot beetle um this is going to be the ecosystem and this is the style for the presentation right so that just gives a real quick snapshot of everything and then um the last parts here so this is just me exploring a little bit more into the lava um example some more reference of different beetle grubs and lava here um, and then I also sort of halfway through the project, I realized I wanted to 
uh, make things feel a little bit less realistic and a bit more cute in silhouette. So these are some examples of how I could do that. And so it's much more about the shape language of everything. You can see that here. So we'll get into that a bit more as we go through the modeling most likely. Um, but that was something I wanted to do and we explored as I went through the project. I also have this idea of how it could roll up into being a simple shape or primitive here um, in terms of the, the actual uh, B tool transformation. And then here is reference for the flowers. Uh, this stuff I um, actually went through in terms of modeling as well. So it was great to have this in terms of the reference. And I just, the same thing for reference gathering, I just try to figure out the different species of flowers. So I've got some advice from people with a bit more knowledge about flowers than me. So I had this uh, photography and I, I can't remember the artist um, who took this particular photo. Um, but this photo of a beetle on a flower was my overall sort of look I wanted to go for in terms of the presentation of my my final screenshots. And so in this case, I had that flower, but I wasn't sure what type of flower it was. So I asked some advice and um, these are some flowers that are, are similar. So we have a canna and a, a gladiolus. These flowers definitely are close to that type of flower. I'm not sure if they are that exact flower, but they have the same kind of characteristics. So then I got a bunch of different reference from those particular uh, species. So if you can establish in the same way I did for the, the type of beetle, the type of flower, it's a lot easier to grab reference for that type of thing. So I de generally would then search for say canners and I would get a lot better reference in terms of what I was trying to get there. So that's definitely very helpful. And then the last part of it here is I started to just try to figure out each element. So when I got to modeling, if I was gonna be modeling, say the wings, I had reference that related to the wings or inspiration for how I wanted to create it. Um, so this is just me establishing more the individual elements. So it's basically taking all the reference I already had and just cropping sections of it. Build out different sections for when it comes to modeling. If I'm modeling um, a, a particular section, like I'm modeling the leg, I can look at this area. And um, I often have as well other real world robots and things to help me with the articulation of like how things are gonna move and sockets and that type of stuff. So that's also really helpful um, there as well. So yeah. So in this section, I wanted to jump over into Blender and eventually in the tutorial, we're actually gonna block out um, our model for the B tool this week. But what I wanted to do to start with is just give a little bit of an intro into Blender. Uh, this isn't gonna be an extensive tutorial on how to use Blender, but I'm gonna cover some of the basics so that we can get started. So uh, the first thing I wanted to touch on is, and we just got Blender open here, um, we're going to go over into the preferences window here and I wanted to just basically talk about the add-ons, uh, some of the add-ons I have installed here. So these are a bunch of the add-ons that I have actually installed in the program. So you can see um, the list of different add-ons here. Um, this is some of the stuff that I personally use all the time. Some of it we'll touch on as we go through uh, certain types of add-ons um, that I have enabled and disabled. And so if we turn off the, if we go into the community ones, these are the installed from uh, the community. And then these are the official add-ons that ship as part of Blender. So I also just wanted to go over as well that I have a couple of blogs about Blender on my ArtStation page as well. So the first one is about the add-ons that I generally tend to use. So this is a, a blog that's um, wrote specifically for add-ons and you can see a bunch of these. These are still pretty up to date as far as the ones that I generally will use a lot. And it talks about the different ones that you might want to enable or disable as part of Blender. And then I also have another page or blog here, which is about how to actually learn Blender, a couple of good tutorials, the ones that I actually watched uh, when it came to learning Blender as a program itself. But we'll start just with some real basic stuff in Blender as well. So. Um, the first thing here is we're in the modeling tab and I have um, screencast keys turned on as well so you can see what I'm pressing as I'm moving forward. So the first thing that I usually like to do in my workspace is I'll have my modeling tab in here. One of the most useful shortcuts is shift A um, to add objects. So that's gonna bring up our menu here for adding meshes. So if we wanted to add say 
um, a plane or a cube or something like that. We can click that and it's going to bring it into the scene here. At the moment, we're in object mode, which is basically allows us to manipulate objects in the scene, move them around. Um, we can rotate and translate them. And most of the controls that we have for our objects here are on the left hand side. So this is our tools panel, which we can hide by pressing T. And then this is our end panel, which is basically the tools and options we have here as well. As far as um, Blender's interface is concerned, uh, the top menu bar is a series of different tabs. These tabs basically switch between workspaces. So at the moment we're in the modeling workspace. If we wanted to switch to UVs, it's gonna jump over into the UV uh, workspace here. And you can see that we're over in um, the UVs and everything and you've got the windows open. So most of the time for this particular part of the tutorial, I'm gonna be sticking with the modeling section. Um, we have a bunch of tools that relate um, in the top bar underneath this. So this is where all of our snapping controls and our pivot options live um, in here. And then this section on the right hand side is where we change um, overlays such as things like the wireframe and options like that. You can see that here. And then we can also switch between the different rendered modes. So we have our wireframe, our solid view, um, and actually our shaded view as well, textured view. So that's that. And then on the right hand side for modeling, this is our outliner. So this is where all of the objects are going to live. And as we add collections in here, we can right click and add collections and then organize our objects and um, do useful things in here as far as organization is concerned. And then on the bottom menu bar here, this is the property. So this is where we change things like adding modifiers. You can get into the individual options for the meshes, such as the smoothing and normals and things like that. Um, and then just the top ones are mostly about options for the scene itself. So that's like useful if you're doing rendering or you want to set the resolution of your images. Um, so most of these you won't really tend to touch too much when you're modeling but you'll be looking in these areas here. So we'll kind of go over as we start modeling uh, those different sections. And then the uh, other thing to bear in mind when you're working in Blender, and I have um, changed the controls for moving around at the moment. So uh, middle click for me is basically pan. I hold alt and middle click to rotate and then I can zoom in and out with the mouse wheel. But that isn't the default Blender controls. Those are just how I have it set up. So if you want to change um, shortcuts, you can come over into the key map section and you go to edit preferences um, and we have our key map. This is where we change the shortcuts for things as well. So if we wanted to uh, change our rotate um, or change it, let's change changing our pan, for example, in the you'd search for where it says uh, 3D view. And then you can see here that I have that mapped to the middle mouse. So I can change that if I wanted to change the way I pan around. Right. Um, the other thing that's a bit unusual about Blender is to get into editing the vertices and the edges of a model, we're going to hit tab and that's going to bring up um, those options. And you can see here that we have um, edges and verts and faces and we can cycle between those using one, two and three on the keyboard. That's going to move between those different objects uh, types. And then we can do the, a lot of the same kind of um, operations here. We can move and rotate and transform, scale those. Um, I mostly will be using shortcuts, so you'll see those come up as I start to um, edit and, and manipulate stuff. Here is also a bunch of our tools that we use. I mostly don't tend to use these tools from this menu bar. Um, you can use these different tools like we can extrude out here, but I wouldn't tend to use those tools. Most of the time, I'm just going to press E to extrude or Alt E to bring up the other extrude menu with a bunch of options. So um, a lot of the time I'm pretty much when I'm modeling using shortcuts. So we'll sort of try and go through that as we model. And I try to make sure that I call out stuff when I'm modeling things. So, um, but as well as that, we also have the, um, we're establishing here our keys. So you can see as I'm doing things and manipulating what keys and buttons I'm pressing, right? Okay, so that gives a really quick intro. Um, as I mentioned, just to recap, we've gone through the add-ons that I'm using. I probably will also provide a list of the add-ons so that you can see the ones that I commonly use. Um, but also, as well as that, we have the page, the website here, which shows um, the process I went through for learning Blender, some of the basic tutorials I watched and things that I found helpful. Um, if you're a complete beginner and you don't know how to use Blender, then I would definitely advise going through some of these. And then um, the add-ons as well, 
the ones that I commonly use. So as I mentioned, we're not going to go an extensive kind of look into Blender and um, Blender is also not essential to use for this tutorial. So if you are using another 3D modeling package, a lot of the same lessons will apply. Um, so Blender is good just because it's free. So for people getting into it, you don't need to worry too much about a license. You can definitely just get into Blender for this tutorial. Um, so yeah, and I, um, on a uh, sort of personally for modeling now, this is the package that I tend to use. So um, it's definitely worth me kind of showcasing the modeling and the prop modeling inside of Blender. So um, cool, I hope that's helpful. And in the next um, part of the, uh, the video, we'll be going over how to actually start making the block out. Hey everyone. So in this section, we're actually gonna cover how to block out our beetle and start modeling uh, the prop that we're gonna work on for this tutorial. So uh, the first thing I wanted to just establish was this is the uh, block out that I created for the beetle project. So I just wanted to share that here. Uh, we are actually gonna model out the elements um, in real time, but I just wanted to show what we're aiming for to begin with. Um, so here is an example of the sort of detail that I would expect at this stage. So it's very simple. Uh, primitive forms. We've established the majority of the different elements. We've got uh, the heads and the horn in there. We've obviously got our um, different sections for the legs and, and the back and everything there. So it's really rough, but it gives us a good idea um, as well. One of the first things I'll also do when I'm looking at um, assets is I'll try to establish what the scale is in, in real world terms. And so just a really quick Google, I got um, a diagram here which shows uh, this is the beetle that I actually based um, the prop on. So we've got the Hercules beetle. I've just um, searched for the scale here. And you can see this gives us a rough indication of the size. So um, about six to 18 centimeters in length. Um, for some reason this is in millimeters and inches here, but um, again, 1.2 centimeters to 3.6 centimeters um, in terms of height, and then 1.7 to 5.3 in terms of width. So I've made a box that roughly represents that scale. So five centimeters across 16 centimeters by four centimeters roughly. So that gives us a good indication. Um, I'm not super worried in this case about the scale being very, very accurate. Um, and one of the things I actually do um, as part of the modeling process is I scale everything up because one of the problems if you try to model at a really small scale like this is when you start to use things like bevels and, and modifiers and everything, you'll notice that you have to use very, very tiny values for those types of things. So it can be a little bit tricky to work with. Um, and because I'm not too worried about this scale of this object um, for, I, I could always you know, scale him up and down in terms of the actual final model. So I'm not too worried about it in this case. Um, while I'm modeling, I potentially will scale this up a little bit larger. But just getting an idea of what the scale um, should be in real world terms is always useful uh, when it comes to this type of stuff. So that's some of the, the very basic beginning parts of this. Uh, the other thing I wanted to cover was about um, resources. So I'm just going to jump over into a different version of Blender here. And something I wanted to uh, just talk about is, um, the, is an add-on. So I'm just going to quickly search for that. So here's the website using um, Sketchfab. Uh, they've actually introduced an add-on in Blender where you can download resources or models uh, using the Sketchfab interface directly into Blender. So this is something I actually used as part of my project and I found it was really helpful for just getting started. So especially if you are a beginner, I would definitely suggest this. So if you go over um, and grab the plugin, you can just download this. You just want to come over and um, download the zip file here, which is the um, Sketchfab plugin. And then over in Blender, to install plugins, all you would do is come over into the preferences section here. And I've actually already installed it, but you basically just click this install button and choose the zip file. And then we're gonna enable the plugin here. And this will come up on the right hand side. And so if you had an animal like a beetle, for example, you can do a search for beetle. And then what you can see here is that give it a second to load, it will basically load in um, different beetles. And you can see that in this case, it's also pulling up Volkswagen beetles as in the car as well. But what's really nice about this is you can basically click the beetle, click import, and it's going to bring that model into the scene. So then you can use that as a actual um, resource or a reference. So in this case, 
Um, it's it's brought in the object. I'm not sure why it's got all these um, extra sections in here. So it's actually, for some reason, it's underneath underneath everything. But you can see here that we have um, a beetle model that we can actually use as a guide or a reference. So um, I definitely found that this was really helpful when it came to just getting the initial shapes established because um, just trying to understand the shapes of the legs from references is sometimes a little bit harder. So this can be really helpful for more organic things, um, definitely. So um, just jumping back over into the scene that I have here, we'll just jump over into this one and let me close out these other instances of Blender that I have open so we can just uh, keep that a clean base. So I'll just close this one as well. Um, okay, so I'll also just share the ones that I had downloaded here so we can see the types of resources that I was actually using when I was first starting to block things out. So um, here is, let me turn off the legs here as well. So, and we can remove this scale as well. So this is just a an example of a Hercules beetle. What I liked about this one is that it has a lot of the underside parts um, that would be difficult to gather from reference as well. I mean, I do have um, some of that in reference. Like we can see here that I have some of that underside, but it's obviously a lot more difficult to grab reference images of that. So having it modeled out is definitely very helpful to see what the shapes look like um, underneath. And obviously we're going to be changing this guy up a lot for um, robotic looking beetle. So it's this is obviously more supposed to be like a real beetle. Um, so we'll use it as a guide, but we're, we're definitely not going to be trying to get a look like this, right? We're not trying to do a realistic beetle. We're trying to do a robotic one. Um, and then this one is a, a rhino beetle. Uh, this one is, is more of a scan. So you can see it's actually from a real world beetle. Um, so you can see a lot of the shapes and uh, the patterns on the shells and things like that, which are really nice to see. But um, again, this is just a reference and a guide that we can use. And then we also have these um, Hercules beetles as a series of different ones we've got. Um, and I think these ones are actually from, because you can see there's a, um, a section on the bottom here where it attaches to something. I think these are like a scientific um, model that could be used um, sort of in a museum or something like that. Um, and you can just see that we can um, get these different versions. So this one is the male one. We've got the female beetle as well. And then we've just got it separated out into the body and also um, into the legs as well. So we can see those different sections. So we'll definitely be using these as a guide when it comes to modeling. And in some cases, we can use it to actually generate some basic geometry for us for our block out. So we'll be covering that as we start to do our modeling. So I just wanted to give that um, explanation there because I think it's a really helpful resource um, to be able to download and you can obviously use that as well if you are trying to you know if you didn't want to use um, say you you wanted to grab like other animals as well if you wanted to grab say a frog or you were doing a different model that wasn't a beetle um, you wanted to do something more simple then you could definitely use that to give you a guideline for modeling so hopefully that's helpful Okay, so now we're gonna actually start uh, blocking out our beetle. The first thing I wanted to do is just establish um, a hierarchy in terms of the folders and everything that we have here in the outliner. So uh, you can right click and add new collections um, or also press this little plus button up here to add layers. So um, I've actually got my existing beetle that I showed here. I can hide and unhide that for reference. But the first thing I wanna do is basically establish um, folders. So the first thing I'm going to uh, probably do here is just create a new collection and this is going to be the beetle uh, block out, let's say. I want to create folders for each of the sections. So I'm going to do one for the head and one for the body. So I'll just kind of duplicate these up and rename these. Um, so I'll call this body. And then this is where we're going to keep our final thing. And if we look at the existing structure of everything, I have um, a working and a final uh, folder. And the reason for this is because um, in some cases I want to use uh, instancing to basically repeat the object. So if we turn this on, I can sort of showcase that. Um, here we have the legs. Um, these are um, instances and we actually have our working files in here. So we're gonna go over that process and then our actual body and our head are within these folders here. So um, we'll go over that structure, but for now what I'll probably do is create a separate folder, which will just be the working files. And then I can create 
um, my legs. So this will be the beetle legs in here. So we have that kind of basic structure that we've created using the collections. So um, for example, um, if we wanted to create our head here, we'll just um, quickly add in some kind of rough shapes and cubes for the different sections. So like this is gonna be um, our head and we can match, I mean, we can match the current scale that we have or also um, using our reference guides that we have here as well. So if I go to, um, we'll pick this uh, one here and we'll enable that as well. So just grab our beetle. So if we just get like our rough objects in so that we know the sort of rough scales of these, I'm just gonna basically manipulate these cubes and that's gonna give us our head and our body. So I'm just gonna put these in for now just as uh, bases. And so now I wanna just uh, show the process of creating the legs and how we're gonna actually use um, collections and instancing to um, repeat those sections. Okay, so for the, for the legs, um, if we have a look at our references here, I'm just gonna pull over um, where we start to look at the anatomy of our legs here. So just um, open this one up here. You can see this is the rough structure of the leg you have um, a section here which is attached to the bottom of the body. We then have the femur and the tibia, which are the different sections of the leg, and then breaks into uh, different sections here depending on um, the shape of the beetle. So if we look at that in terms of um, a real world reference as well, you can see that it is easy to kind of break into sections or into chunks here. So this is a good example. You can see how it's being broken down into the foot, into the tibia, into the femur, um, and then the coxa here as well, which is attached to the body. So um, that's um, repeated. So as we can see here, we have all these different legs. We have six legs for the beetle. So um, it makes sense to kind of break these pieces down into different sections and then instance them to create the legs of the beetle. So that's what I'm gonna do here. So the first thing I wanna do, um, and I can use these guys as a guide, right? <clears throat> to establish the sort of scale. So if I was to, um, just start, and I'm starting just with real basic shapes. I'm starting with the cubes, and then we'll get into actually detailing these up into a better block out models um, as well. So I'm jumping around like different views here with the reference. So I'm pressing the um, the slash key here, um, and I can just go into the different view modes. So if I wanted to look at this from the bottom view here, I think this is actually the tilde key that I'm pressing. The tilde key brings up this radial menu for, for the views. So I'm just gonna jump to the bottom and I just wanna get the rough size of this. Like I don't care too much about um, the actual look of it at the moment. I just wanna get the rough scale. And also um, we wanna try and put the pivot point of this where it kind of makes sense that it would move around. So you can see that actually the pivot's kind of in a pretty good place. If this was gonna be moving around, um, it's gonna be orientated from there and it seems to be working pretty nicely, right? So. <clears throat> Once I have that, let's make a few different um, folders for these different sections. So as far as our reference is concerned, we look at this um, from before. This is the femur. So I'm going to basically just make a, um, a folder under beetle leg, and I'm just going to call that femur. So we can um, add this one to that. Let's move it into the folder. And then what I want to do here is I wanna position this, um, reset the transforms basically. So we're gonna put this into world zero orientation here. And then the scale will just reset the scale as well. Um, we can check on our other objects as well. We can reset the scale on these as well. Um, so we just got our theme. And I what I wanna do as well is I want this to orientate uh, facing forward. So at the moment it's facing to the right hand side. So when we look at the front, we're actually looking at the side of the leg. Um, but I want to orientate it so that it's this way, so that we have it. Uh, this is viewing from the front of the leg as if we were looking kind of downwards this direction, right? So that's our first um, shape established. And then what I'll probably do here is um, for the next bit, we're going to create a folder for the tibia, which is the next part of the, the leg there. So I'm going to do the same thing. And I'm just actually going to duplicate this same box by pressing Shift D. And then I'm going to come over here and I'm just going to get the right roughly the right scale of this as well. You can rotate it if you wanna uh, check as well. We're just trying to rough rough this out at the moment. I'm not too worried about this being absolutely perfect. I'm just kind of sliding this into place, right? So we can also just move this kind of up to get the rough scale as well. And remember that we're gonna ro 
uh, reset the rotation and everything here as well. So we're just going to something like that. That feels like it's roughly matching the volume and the shape of the object there. So we can just reset the rotation, we'll reset the scale, um, and then I'm just going to orientate that back. So now we have this guy, we can just rotate it 90 degrees. And we'll just press, I'm pressing control A to reset the scale here. So um, cool, so that's resetting everything. We'll reset the rotation as well for both of these. Okay, so that's got our different leg pieces in place. I wanna make sure I've got the right one in the right folders there. Um, and then finally, we're gonna do the foot. So we're just gonna come in here and we're gonna establish the foot. Um, I think I've also, the reason this is saying foot 01 is because I already have in my working files uh, done something similar with the leg where I've renamed this to be um, foot. So that's why it's uh, renaming this to be foot underscore one. So what we'll do is we'll just, um, we'll call this, so this one is the, is is our finished one. So I'm just going to put an F over on after these just for, for finished so that we know um, it's not going to duplicate the names there. So we'll just do that. Um, and we can do the same for the head as well, right? So I'm just putting a couple of names in here just so that it, avoids um, duplicating the folder names and everything there. So, okay, so now um, we can rename this and it should be all good. So we have the foot. I'm gonna come in to establish the shape of the foot in the same way I did before. So I'm just basically roughing out um, the shape. We're gonna scale this. So I'm scaling um, just by pressing S and then I press the axis I wanna scale on. So X to scale and the axis here, and then I can move this up as well. We'll scale S and Z on the Z axis, and then I'm just gonna move this to roughly align with the foot. So this is gonna be the foot. And then to move the pivot, um, I'm using an add-on um, called Pivot Transform, which just allows me to edit this. You can do it by clicking, um, if you don't have the add-on, you can do it by clicking the drop-down um, and effect origin. This will now allow you to move um, the pivot and then that's going to move into location but usually I would use pivot transform and just use the transform option to to do that so um, cool all right so that's um now we've got the pivot in the in the right place there uh, we can do the same thing just rotate move and we'll reset the scale um, okay and then this one we now want to move into the foot location so we now have our legs established um, they're at world origin so if we hide our beetle now um, the next thing is we want to actually just have a, a version of our leg, right? So the first thing we're going to do is create a new folder under the block out and we'll call call this leg. So what we're going to do here now is, um, and this can just be uh, legs B for block out, that's fine. And then what we're going to do is uh, we're going to reconstruct our leg out of those pieces. So uh, the way that we do that is we will kind of hide the working files and then what we're going to do is we have the femur, the tibia, and the foot. I'm gonna bring back my reference that I was using just so I can position these correctly. And I'm gonna press Control um, or Shift A to bring up my add menu, and I'm gonna to come to collection instance, and then I'm gonna search for femur, right? So if we add that femur in, um, we now have the femur as an instance, and this is actually a collection instance. So if we add or make changes to the femur itself, what you'll see is that this will update that collection. So that's really helpful because it means we can add to this collection later and it's gonna update the legs. So um, yeah, so the first thing we wanna do is just build out the position of the femur. We'll just align it kind of where it was before. We're gonna bring it down. Um, and so I'm just gonna hide the working files again. We're just gonna position this where we want it to go. So that's our femur added. Um, you can see that empty uh, scale at the moment is really large. So because um, I have hard ops installed, what I usually do is just press Q and just bring the empty scale down so that we don't have to see that um, overview. Then I'll duplicate, you could duplicate the femur and then change under the collection instance here, we could alter, um, change that, but it will keep the name um, the same there. So what we could do as well is just do another one here and we'll choose the tibia. So now we can actually position our other piece of the foot rotate that kind of roughly where we want it to be. Um, and then this is now gonna create um, our foot piece here. And then if we wanted to do the alternative method, we could duplicate this. And then where it says under the object properties um, on the properties window here, where it says tibia, we could just change this to be foot. 
and it's going to swap that out for the foot, right? So now we have um, these guys established. We can also reduce the um, empty scale. And then for the other feet, like to get those working how we want, we can just essentially now duplicate these um, that we've created here. So we have, we can rename this as well if we need to. So we have our tibia. We could also just rename this um, foot so that we know that piece is the foot piece. And so we can just now duplicate these um, control click to select them all and then shift D to duplicate them. And then we can actually position our um, our pivot or oh, sorry, position our legs here. So we can just rotate these. Um, another trick that you can also do is to parent these. So if we um, select this guy first and this one second and press control P, um, we can parent it. And now when we rotate this leg, it's also going to rotate the other one here as well. And then we could parent this guy to here as well. So that now um, these have a hierarchy. So you can see that under the outliner that they're parented to each other. So when we select these guys, we can duplicate them and that parenting is um, respected, which means that when we move this guy here, we can just basically rotate the leg and the foot will come with it, which is pretty handy. So we're just kind of roughing this out and establishing the shapes and everything. We're not too worried about everything being perfect for now. And we will obviously um, improve these as we go along, but you can kind of see that we're getting our legs um, established. We probably would want to move these into the right location for the knees as well so that they kind of line up. You can sort of see that here. So we're just playing around with the transforms until we get this roughly into the right spot. You can rotate the um, the legs and everything into the right position. So if we now hide our reference, you can see that we've got um, basically boxes or, or, or volume that we can actually see um, to establish the shapes and the forms of our model. So the next thing now is just to um, discuss the different ways that I'll start to actually um, replace these shapes with actual block out models. So that will be the next step. Okay, so now we've got some of our basic volumes of the model blocked out in relation to our references here. I'm going to start by showing different techniques on how we can detail this up to being a more final block out. So uh, we're going to go through poly modeling and box modeling and we'll go through uh, strip modeling and retopology and other different techniques that can showcase how to actually detail this up. As we go through the rest of the tutorial as well, we're going to build on those techniques and uh, use different workflows for actually uh, modeling out the, the beetle here. But I'm going to start off. Uh, the first one I wanted to cover was the workflow for remeshing and retopology. So manipulating um, if we've already got existing geometry, how we can actually turn that into usable geo. So that's going to be the first technique that I show. Okay, so for retopology, uh, the first thing I would do is you need a, an existing piece of geometry and there's a couple of ways to approach this. The first is to retopologize by hand and that technique is uh, relatively straightforward. The first thing that we would want to do is add in um, a vertice here that we can start to extrude from. So I'm going to hold shift and right click to move my 3D cursor. And then I'm going to come to mesh and add a single vert. Uh, from there, I'm going to select vertice mode or press one on the keyboard and I'm going to extrude an edge. And then from that edge, I'll press E to extrude uh, face here. So we now have a face that's sort of aligned roughly to this. And we come to the view mode here, we can actually go into the edit view mode and then we can turn on the retopology option. The moment this just kind of shades it, you can't really see anything. But as we move around the model, you'll see that it's highlighted blue. So we actually need to flip this face. We're going to select the face itself. And I'm going to press Shift N. Um, and I'm going to uh, click this button here that says inside, which is going to basically flip the, um, the face there. So now we can see that it's blue. So we want to snap this to the underlying geometry. So one way we can do that is by adding a modifier called a shrink wrap modifier. So we'll add the shrink wrap and we'll color pick the object and you'll see that now this is going to snap to the face. We want to see that while we're editing verts, we can also click this little button here and now we can see that it's snapped to the face. So if we go to face mode snapping, we can also um, hold control to uh, snap our verts to the face as we move them around as well. Um, the shrink wrap is going to do that, but it just means that we will avoid having uh, vertices that are really far away from the model like this. And then we have to get the shrink wrap to kind of snap them back. So, yeah, it's just going to be better if we also hold control to snap our verts as we move. 
And then to retopologize, the process is pretty simple. You're just basically extruding out faces and then moving them around and manipulating them. So I'm effectively pressing E and then I'm selecting a vert and holding G and control and then moving these around. So I can follow the flow of the mesh um, and snap the verts to what I'm trying to do and align them. Um, and then when I'm finished, this will be the, the model that we have there. So that's how you would approach this by hand. And we'll show that technique when we start to detail up a couple of the sections as well. Another workflow is to use a modifier to basically remesh. We can use the remesh modifier that comes with Blender. Uh, you have a few different options. You can do voxel remesh, sharp remesh, or blocks. Um, generally, sharp or smooth is pretty good, and then you would increase the amount to get um, a retopologized version. But the geometry isn't particularly nice with this particular workflow. Um, you can also turn on smooth shading if you want to smooth it out as well. But this is another way to get slightly cleaner geometry than what we have here, where it's all triangulated um, here. So that's one approach. Another approach which I tend to like to use um, is using quad remesher. This is a an add-on, a paid for add-on. So you effectively select the mesh you would like to uh, run the remesh on. And then in this case, we can choose different options. So adaptive quad count is basically the option for how much topology to put into more detailed areas. So where we have, say, edges or particularly sharp sections, it's going to put more topology in those areas. That's the adaptive size and the quad count. So we can disable and enable that or increase the tolerance for it. I think 50% is the default. And we can turn off uh, these different um, options, we'll get into those later as we use the modifier more, but um, these can control how it retopologizes based off of the normals and the hard edges. You can hover over these as well if you want a description. And then here we have our symmetry mode. So um, with this case, um, I'm going to have symmetry on in the x-axis because this is a symmetrical mesh. And I'm setting the quad count to 1000 and just leaving this as default. And I'll run the remesh. We'll pause it um, and come back once the remesh is finished. Okay, so the remesh is finished now. You can see this is the topology that we ended up with. So it's nice and quadded. Um, this would be a pretty nice basis for our um, head. So I'm just going to move the pivot into the center here. And then I'm just going to move this back to the origin. And we'll sort of position this as our head piece for now. And I'm not worried about this topology being perfect because... Um, we're going to rework this later, but it just gives a good representation for what we need for the head. Um, I don't actually want a horn in this case to be in the center of the head there. Um, you could have that if you wanted to. So to remove that horn, it's quite straightforward. It's basically going to delete the faces, select this piece and delete the horn. And then we'll just um, cap this, press C to fill it out. And then we can come into the sculpting mode. And then I'll turn off the... Um, the gizmo here, and I'm just going to hold shift and basically smooth out this little section that we have here. And then what I'll do from there is run the remesh again. So if I come over into this guy, we'll just remesh again, and that's going to smooth everything out. So now um, we've got this nice, smooth, rounded headpiece, which we can use later on um, for our model. So that's um, the process for doing sort of manual retopology over the top of existing geometry. Um, or also running remesh tools to get some geo that we can start to use. So the next technique I want to show is more uh, box modeling or poly modeling, where we're actually going to manipulate uh, from primitive shapes. So usually I'll add in primitive shapes like I did here for the leg, um, and we're adding in uh, cubes or cylinders and then manipulating that geometry by either adding in edge loops and cutting and then extruding and these kind of options to get the shapes that we want. Um, so that's another technique that we can use. And then we can also use that in combination with our um, subdiv workflow, which we'll show as well. So in the case of this, what I want to do is basically create the leg piece. So we're looking at this section here, which is the femur, the section underneath. And you can see that this is effectively like a cylindrical shape. It's got a slight bend to it. And then it kind of comes out like a bulbous sphere at the end in both these sections. And this looks like a bit more like a ball and socket joint where the two things connect together. And you can see that um, this again is ending in that more bulbous uh, looking shape there. So this is sort of the, the general form I'm trying to capture with this. So to do that, it's really, it's going to be pretty straightforward. I'm actually going to use 
um, a subdiv workflow for this. And so with subdiv, you can press control two to basically do a smoothed result here. We actually have got two of these, so I'll just remove that. And what you'll see is that if I turn on the optimal display, this is basically gonna add more topology and smooth out the shape. So we go from this cube to this type of shape. And so you can control the smoothing by coming into edit mode and using um, say edges to kind of smooth that out and give a nice shape. The other way to also manipulate this is using creases. And we can do creases by coming over into the end panel here and add the crease to an edge, right? So if we did that here, you're gonna see that we get a sharp um, edge where this is being manipulated. So if we were to add all creases to all the faces, it's basically gonna come back to being a cube again. So you can use that to control the smoothing. Another way I like to do that is using hard ops by coming over into um, the menu, the, the hops helper here, and basically turning it to creases. And then I can select the edges I want to uh, crease and press Q and mark those as creases. So this can be really helpful for just going through and quickly setting your crease sets. Um, so that's how that looks. We can turn on the optimal display if we don't want to see um, the topology there. So in this case, what I would do to kind of get that nice smooth leg shape I'm going to start kind of adding in shapes here to basically create the bulbous look of the ends here. So we're going to extrude out a piece here. And then I want to basically extrude out in all directions on this particular area. So I'm going to press I to inset and hold control, which is basically going to extrude that out. So now if we smooth that, you'll see that we're getting a little bit more of that kind of shape that we can see there. The next step is to kind of try to manipulate the edges we already have. So I'm just gonna essentially drag these ones to kind of smooth that out a little bit there. I'm probably gonna remove these guys for now because we don't need those ones. Um, the creases as well, we can just remove creases for now and keep it more bulbous as you can see here. So starting to resemble more like a bone type shape, which is pretty cool. Then I'm gonna start to actually make the bends that we wanted to have as well. So um, to see through the model and actually manipulate all of these verts that we can see here, I'm gonna press Alt-Z, which will give me the transparency mode and I can just see through that and start to manipulate that here. I also just wanna kind of pull in these verts at the bottom as well to try to give that more of a, a spherical shape. We can do that both ends as well, which will kind of deform the shape a little bit. Another thing I'd like to do is add some verts in here and then kind of pull those out to get much more of a rounded, profile to these shapes. Um, so something more along the lines of that, which is working pretty nicely. To kind of cut in the shape that we have on the end, there's a couple of ways to do that. Um, we can cut it in manually. So if we were to kind of come in here um, and add some edges in, and then we could just sort of bevel this out. So if we do that, I'm gonna bevel it. Um, and then we can sort of cut through the geometry just by pressing C and then removing that face, which is gonna give us this guy. And then um, we can actually extrude backwards as well by using, if I press Alt E, I'm gonna use extrude manifold, which basically means that it's gonna um, weld the verts as we as we extrude. Um, and I'm just gonna tidy up this stuff as well. So just kind of move these faces around and we'll just, we'll recreate these how I want them to actually be. So we're just gonna um, essentially weld these up. Um, actually, let me think about, let's put uh, another loop cut in there. Just going to try and keep it as much as much as I can. I'm trying to keep these quads just so that they will smooth um, nicely here. So we're just basically welding these up. We can press F to fill these out. So now we've got this kind of shape. I'm going to start to move this one out here. So that's starting to look pretty good. And then hopefully once we smooth, we can see that we're getting... There's enough space in there now for the other leg to basically connect in, right? So that's what I'm aiming for here. With this end bit... I also want to make this feel a little bit more bulbous. So I'm going to start uh, kind of extruding this out a little bit and trying to get more of a, um, a shape and form uh, to this, this particular area, right? That's what I'm trying to do here. So we might just also scale this a little bit so it becomes a little bit more rounded and a bit more bulbous. Um, some of these aren't really aligning great. So I'm just going to come in and try and uh, solve those as well. So we're starting to kind of get that interesting shape. Um, look at it from different angles as well to try and judge the silhouette as much as possible. Um, and we're just trying to manipulate everything that we have there. So 
it's kind of how we're starting to do it. You can see the forms that we're getting there. Um, I'm just by manipulating the verts here, I'm getting roughly what I want. Another thing you can also do is jump over into the sculpt mode. Um, and I usually turn the gizmo off when I'm sculpting and I will just basically use uh, the shift brush to kind of smooth things and then the draw brush to sort of push things inwards and out. And you can hold control if you want to do the opposite effect. So in this case, you know, I'm effectively just starting to uh, hold control to sort of push this out to make this a nice bulbous shape and then holding shift to smooth it. And then if I click, it's going to push things in and out. So this is a nice way, again, to sort of manipulate those shapes, right? So that, in a nutshell, covers the sort of boxy modeling part and more of the subdivision workflow. And we'll use that in a lot of cases to create off shapes and forms. So for more organic shapes like this, I'm going to probably use um, more strip modeling like the retopology workflow that we, that we showed. And then for things that are a bit more squarer, um, or simple shapes like spheres and things like that will most likely start from primitive shapes like cubes and cylinders and then manipulate the geometry to get us into the shape that we want. So now um, as well, we can just see how that's starting to look because I've updated um, that as well in terms of the model, right? You can actually start to see that that's updating as far as the legs are concerned. So now you can judge how things are looking um, we can start to move these into the sockets of the actual leg shape and then um, turn the gizmo back on. We can also start to rotate our legs as well if we wanted to view how those are going to look at different angles. So we can just get a feel um, for how all of this is starting to work and, and sort of interact together to get that sort of feeling across, right? So again, we can sort of manipulate this um, to create our leg shape and start to feel how the uh, beetle is coming together. Okay, so now we're gonna show a couple of the techniques to start finishing off the block out of the beetle. So um, to get the shape of the shell, I'm actually going to use the hand retopology method that I showed earlier. So I'm just gonna start by adding in um, the gizmo here by shift and right clicking. And then I'm gonna come in and add a single vert into here. We're gonna select vert mode and extrude that and we'll extrude the face here. So now, um, I've got this set up. I want to add a shrink wrap to this. So we'll do the shrink wrap and we'll select the face underneath. I'm going to come over into edit mode and into retopology mode. And then I'm just going to flip the face normal here so we can actually start to see our retopology mode. So this is all now working pretty nicely. Um, we're going to turn on face snap so we can actually snap our verts. And I'm going to keep this um, really, the face is as large as I can possibly go to basically describe the form. And so as I start to extrude these out, I want to keep my faces pretty big. And the reason for that is because um, if I get too detailed, the smoothing of this isn't going to work super well. And it's also going to mean that manipulating the geometry is a little bit harder. So keep this as big as you can um, when you're working. And I'm just looking to try to follow the shapes. We didn't really do a great job of um, snapping those verts there. So let me just come back and snap those um, and we'll just sort of snap and align. So I'm just trying to describe the shape of the shell here and just manipulate the verts until I get these roughly in the right place. But I want it to follow the flow of the shape of the shell. So I'm basically just trying to put in edges and I'm trying to keep, um, as I mentioned before, I'm trying to keep to quads as much as possible. I'm um, not trying to do triangles if I can help it. Um, I'm not worried if I have the occasional one, but I'm just generally trying to keep quads, which will make smoothing and things easier later on. So uh, we'll just kind of come into there for that one, and I might just add another edge in. Um, so yeah, I'm going to snap these guys as well. And it might also just be helpful to turn on the vert snapping so we can see that this is actually aligning pretty well with the shrink wrap. Um, so that's all good. Okay, so now... Um, I basically want to extrude these out and try to align them with the edges that I have here. So we're just sort of going through um, and aligning them. I might add another cut into this one so it's a bit more even um, there. And then we'll just align, start to align the verts here. So that's all looking good. And then we're just going to basically press F to fill in these verts that we have or these faces that we have in here. Um, so that's looking pretty good. And then um, for this guy, what we want to do is basically uh, fill these out as well. So we can start to then just get a nice result. 
Okay, so that's how we've got the topology sorted out for the shell. And I'm also going to just quickly align these a little bit nicer as well. So that's looking pretty good so far. Um, I'm going to commit that with the shrink wrap, just press control A, and then we'll move our shell over here. Um, we're going to come in and basically put the shell in, um, in, in case of this box. So we'll remove the box. We're going to shade smooth on the shell. And then I'm going to actually add a solidify modifier to this. And so if I do that, you'll see that this is given a thickness to the shell and we can also add a smooth to that. So a subdivision to, to this guy as well. And then what I'll do to mirror things, I usually like to add an empty with a, um, just a plain axis in there. And we'll put that in the center of the scene um, and I'll call that mirror. So I usually use this as a mirror plane. So I'll just select the mirror object and then Alt X to mirror uh, the result we have here. Where this is getting welded together, I'm going to come into the merge options and change the size of this and it's not going to merge together. Um, we'll come over into the retopology and just disable that. And then what I'm going to do as well is I'm going to align these verts. So I'm going to press S, X and zero and that's going to align them. Do you want to select like this and then just move that roughly into the center for now. We do want a bit of a gap there, so I'm not going to move it 100%. But you can kind of see this has given us the basis for the shell in the back, right? So that gets that in there. For the underside piece, I'm probably just going to quickly run a, a retopology on this. So let me just uh, save here as well. So I mostly want to do that because I want the underside um, sockets for where the legs are going to go represented in the block out. So that's why I'm just going to quickly run this retopology on that. So for this one, I want to um, start by just merging the verts because this has got um, lots of unwelded verts, this particular model. So we'll just do that and then we'll run um, our retopology and we're going to retopo this into something a bit more simplistic with a lower poly count. So that's, that's pretty good for now. Um, I'm not worried too much about the shapes of this and what's actually on the top because I can retopologize and model back over this later as well if I want like more detailed pieces. Um, so we'll just go through and we'll just sort of start to add this back together. So now we have our shapes there, which means that we can actually see how our leg is coming together. So the leg can sit in these sockets and we'll just try and line these up roughly with where they need to actually exist. Um, and then we can just kind of come in here and tweak the leg position there. So already getting a pretty good basis for our block out here for the beetle. Um, and you can see the topology is pretty simplistic. We can definitely manipulate this quite easily later once we get into the high poly. So next I want to um, start by doing the eyes. So this is going to be really straightforward because I know the eyes are a sphere. So we'll just come in and add a UV sphere. And then I'm just going to scale this down. I want to try and match the rough scale that we have in here and just get the position of that roughly correct. And then we'll just put this as a, we'll sort of smooth this out. We're gonna do a shade smooth and then we're just gonna move this over to where the eyes are. So this guy, we probably want to bring this down because we want the the head and everything to align, um, everything to align correctly. And so what I want, let me turn off the legs and show you the thing I'm aiming for here is basically want this guy to where the sockets are and where the legs are going to align. I want that to be along the same axis. So essentially uh, we have everything aligning where the legs pos are positioned. So we'll just do that. And then you can see that this one is not really aligning super well. So change the pivot and just move him down a little bit. So now you can see that the legs are all aligned in the same axis there. Okay, and then if we just move our eye socket there. So next is the the horn shape. So for this, um, this is really straightforward. All I want to do for the horn at the moment is just have a cylindrical shape. So what I would probably do to start with is maybe look at just a grabbing a cylinder shape. And I'm going to keep that pretty low poly, maybe like eight sided. Um, we can always add subdivision to this later. So um, I'm just going to sort of start to manipulate that and rotate that into the right position. And this is where 
we can use um, a combination of more of a poly modeling approach but it also can definitely feel more like a strip modeling approach as well because um, you can sort of see that as we extrude these we're going to scale the edges and you can start to see that as we rotate things uh, we're going to get that shape so we're just starting to build up the shape of the horn um, really quickly i'm not too worried at the moment for the block out of it being absolutely perfect at the end like i don't necessarily want this um split look and i need to decide i want to decide later when i actually make my model what the shape of this horn is going to be potentially i won't do this sort of split design i might just go for more of a a general um, horn type shape so this is going to cover the shape of the horn pretty well just to begin with and we can position that in um, we want to change the proportion of the horn as well another really easy nice way to do that would be to use like a soft selection so we're just sort of starting to manipulate that going to shade shade it as well um, so we'll just shade smooth the horn and then i can press um, two to do a um, a subdivision um, i'm just going to come back out of this view and then i'm going to put the i'm going to mirror uh, the eye socket as well so we'll just mirror that so you can see the eye on the other side um, and then that should give us a pretty good basis there for this uh, what I want to do, yeah, so the soft select, sorry, was the thing I wanted to show. So you can press O on the keyboard, which will enable soft select or click up here. And then when you press G, you'll see that you get this wheel. You can cycle that up and down with the mouse wheel and then just use that to manipulate um, the horn. You can also scale out as well. So you don't have to use, um, you could do a soft selection scale as well. So we can do a lot of stuff here. So for this case, I probably actually want the horn to be maybe a little bit, um, a little bit smaller there because I think that's going to be a better proportion and everything. So yeah, we're starting to get into a, a pretty good spot there. Um, I think in uh, let's sort of move some of these things into the right position. So this one is in the body, so we'll move that there. This is the head, so we'll come in here with this guy and also for the head. So now we're a bit more organized. We can start to delete some of our other objects that we have in there and then next i'm going to just finish off and work on the legs themselves as well so now to uh, move over to detailing out the legs we've got uh, the final sections of these just to finish out so we have our tibia and our foot so we'll start uh, with the tibia section here so uh, you can see that in this example it is essentially a similar shape to what we have here a cylindrical shape which has a nice kind of bend to it like an s-curve type shape but then it has these more um, horn type shapes. So they're more kind of um, sharper uh, sections to the end of the leg there. So again, we can approach this in, the, in a similar sort of way to how we did before, where we start to actually add in um, some box modeling and everything and just um, flesh that design out. So if we come over into the, the uh, tibia, we'll just enable that. You can see here one thing i also like to do at this stage is i would also like to add in um sort of i guess they would be helpers to basically tell me uh the rotation and how these are going to line up so we're putting in a uh, a cylinder here because we know that looking at the rotation of this essentially what's going to happen is this is going to rotate um just in one axis this this um elbow joint here right whereas this one is much more of a ball and socket so it's going to rotate as a uh, in most directions this one is only going to rotate in one axis so we're putting in a cylinder into this one and then we can do the same um for the femur as well so if we put in um this cylinder that we have and just find these guys we'll put them actually where they need to go so let's put them in here and then this one um, we're going to put into the femur and then what we'll do in this cylinder here is we're going to line this up with uh, where we want the cylinder or the leg to actually be placed so that can be used as a guide so when we come to our block out you can see that we've got our cylinder in here and we can then align the leg where this should go so if we change our pivot to be local space pivot we can position this into here and then we know as we rotate this that this is going to be rotating in the right orientation you'll see that with these guys because of the way we position the leg we just rotated this 
um, around. So what we could actually do to resolve this issue is just inversely scale it and then rotate it. So that's going to give us, um, which which is fine for now. We wouldn't want to have um, inverse invert scale in the final model, but we can just do that for uh, positioning for now. So we can actually align things up and set everything up correctly. So now you can see that we've got this roughly these roughly in the right places there. So they don't have to be perfect for now, but just trying to get the idea across of how this is actually going to work. And then for the same. Um, when we look at the, the shape of the foot here as well, at this end, um, going over into our reference, you'll see that we make this a bit bigger, that the rotation of this, this is what it looks like um, in terms of how they rotate on the insect here. So this one you can see is rotating in different axes. This one is only in the one axis on the kneecap. And then if we look at I mean, you can tell by looking at these guys when you see them in motion as well, that this one can rotate in some different axes as well. I think this is connected almost like a ball and socket underneath. So it gives a little bit more manipulation um, on the bottom there. So we could do a similar thing for this where we add in, let's try and add in a um, UV sphere and we'll scale this one down. And then we're just going to position this at the end. So this is where we're going to connect. Likelihood as well is that this is going to be offset and be slightly underneath. So we're going to have more of this kind of situation here where it's offset slightly. Um, but we can add that in. And now you can see this is where this guy will get connected to. So that's sort of how we are going to align things. Um, as far as starting to actually block these out now to be more closer to this type of shape, let's start working on that. So um, we'll just hide the block out here and the first thing I'm going to shade smooth these as well this one um, we could also potentially make these a bit longer by just moving some of these and manipulating them slightly and looking at the shape there I'm going to want to start um, bringing out a little bit let's just turn off soft select we're going to want to scale out these guys a little bit so we're just starting to scale those and bring them up a little bit. And you can also see from the shape as well of those that it does this nice curve. So again, we're going to try and start to manipulate this and bring that big kind of curve forward like this kind of shape, right? And then I want to give it some form in this axis. So we're also going to do this kind of thing so we can start to really get that shape coming through. And we can just be really kind of uh, simple with it for now because we're not s super worried about this being perfect at this stage. We just want to try and get a lot of the shapes and everything in. I'm just going to start to scale these out a bit. I want to make it a bit thicker as well. It doesn't feel like it's really thick enough. But we'll just sort of scale that up and then bring these ones down a bit. And we'll just, we're just we going to shade um, smooth the whole thing so it's nice and been pretty good there. Okay, bringing out the shape. So yeah, and then it's going to end. It has like kind of different spiked shapes. So we can start to build the spikes in as well if we want to. So we can just extrude these out and then kind of scale them down. And that's effectively just going to give us like a really quick way of getting these spikes in, right? So we're just sort of starting to do that using the sub div again to just sort of smooth them out. And then I think this one, this front one kind of is rotated. If we look at this, it's rotated. We've got one that direction. Oh, and then another one, which is coming forward, right? So we probably would want to give uh, this guy a bit more of a spike here, like this. And we might also, let's actually undo that because I want to add a bit of a gap between these two spikes. So I'm going to do Thing a bit more like that which just means we can start to control this a little bit there and then we also have another one that's sort of here on the end so i'm going to do the same thing just sort of extrude that out and then our cylinder that we have that sort of um sits between the two of these so this guy here the the um sphere i should say i want to also try to get because you can see that this kind of bends 
um, I want to try and manipulate some of the shapes that we have here as well. So um, let's try and just sort of move some of these down. We're going to make this one more of a spiky shape. And then these guys, we're going to basically pull those down. Um, and we'll also pull this edge down so we can start to bend. And then what we want to do here is start to pull this one up so we can create that nice overhang look, right? So we're just manipulating the geometry really simply here, just trying to get the forms across by looking at the reference that we have. Um, you can also use your, your pure reference boards to do this as well, but I'm using a actual 3D example just because I have the shapes and forms in there. So this would already be a pretty good basis just to, to work with here. So let's kind of leave that one there. Okay, so here we can see um, how this is now looking with the updates to the model. At the moment, he's looking a bit chunky compared to the other one. So we might want to come in um, and just do a little bit of manipulation um, on, that, on that particular area. So it's really simple to do. Obviously, all we do is come in um, to our object and we want to just manipulate, I think, the shapes of this. So we're just going to sort of come in here and just sort of scale these down a little bit so they can get a little bit thinner um, and we'll start to maybe move some areas over as well so let's just kind of move this and manipulate this as well and we can also um, using the soft select um, as well we can sort of easily just push things around i sometimes would find this in the same way we did before you can use things like the um the sculpting tools to to tweak this stuff as well so we can um, play around. Um, you know, I quite like it when it's a bit more chunky and exaggerated as well. So you can definitely get a good feel for how you want that to look. But for now, at least this is looking pretty good. So now we'll start on the final part, which is just the, the claws at the bottom. And these are really easy to understand. They're broken down into different segments. And then you have the claws at the end. So you've got different sections to it, which then connect up to that leg. And then we have the claws. So uh, we're going to do something like that and I'm going to look at the actual real world reference for that as well so you can see this is what the shapes are looking like. So there's two claws um, and then there's uh, one, two, three, four, five sections to it. So again, really simple for that. We're going to come over into the foot. We've already got one piece so we'll just actually manipulate this back into going to start to move this out and create um, maybe four pieces and then one larger piece at the end. So we'll do something like that. So that's gonna create that nice segmented look. And this, the shape of these and the size of these, we can always adjust these and uh, reuse these later. Um, if we want these to actually kind of individually bend and manipulate, uh, we would need uh, bones in those individual sections later. So uh, we probably wouldn't wanna group them all together in one thing, but we can always adjust that later. So. Um, yeah, we're going to sort of scale out the shapes of these a little bit and just get more of that kind of rounded feel to things. Um, for this, I'm probably going to use the um, use the crease sets and everything here, and we'll probably try and set the creases, um, select the creases. So press Shift G to select all the creases, and then I'm going to put the creases down a little bit there. So point point five, which is going to give us our shape. So I'm just sort of manipulating this to give us a, a pretty good look. And then I can do, turn off the soft select to do something similar for these. So just trying to give these a little bit of uh, form as well. Uh, cool, and then we'll do creases again, and I'm just gonna select the creases and also do the same thing as before. So we're just kind of segmenting. I'm gonna basically now uh, duplicate this segment and create a few more kind of coming back here, which is now gonna, these are gonna connect up. So we probably want a sphere at the end of this as well. So we'll add in, just turn off the, the reference here as well. We'll add in a, a UV sphere and then we'll just scale this guy down as well. So he's just gonna be where we actually position our pieces. So we wanna just align these. I might make these a little bit smaller as well. So let's just scale those slightly, something like that. It's feeling pretty good. And then we'll just shade this smooth. So this is gonna be our end piece. And then we also wanna add the claws. So the claws, they look like this kind of shape there at the end of this piece. 
Um, the other thing as well is that this has a bit of a bend to it. So I'm going to basically try and do something a bit more like that. We could do the same with these guys as well. If we just edit, um, kind of connect these. Um, that one isn't letting me select the verts on it, which is weird. So let me just... Yeah, okay, let's just, um, I'll tell you what, let's uh, remove the modifiers on these and we'll just, for now, we're just going to join them together so it's easier to manipulate. So to join them, you just select them all and press Control J and then we can now um, set our smoothing and we will just um, grab these sections and I want to pull them, pull them up. So we'll just do that to give them like a nice kind of bend to them, which I think looks pretty cool. And so if I look back at the reference now, you can see it's kind of how this is starting to look, which is pretty good. Uh, these ones, they also need to kind of connect over the top of this. I'm not too worried about that for now because um, this is just a block out. So we'll add now a um, another cube in here and we're going to make our claw shape. So for the claw, all we want to do here is come in and just basically position the cube somewhere here. Um, and then we'll extrude this out. And just for now, I want to really quickly to make this claw, I'm going to just do something along the lines of this, which will basically create our shape. And then I'm just going to bevel the claw. So that's going to give us um, the real simple claw shape. And we can just then, if we want to, we could rotate this and maybe scale them up a little bit. Um, we might want to scale down the claw at the end a bit. So I'm thinking maybe just trying to bring this shape in and I want to, I want to basically make it feel sharp at the end. So I'm just going to try and do that, which is good. Something like that is probably fine for now. We can always refine um, this a lot later, obviously. And then I'll just uh, select the mirror and mirror the claw. So now you can see that we have that nice shape at the end. Um, if we now look at it, this with the actual beetle block out here, uh, we need to move our claws into the foot collection there. So at the moment, this is definitely feeling too large. So we're going to want to scale all of these elements down. And just to quickly do that, I'm going to parent everything to the sphere. And then I'm just going to quickly scale everything and that's going to scale all of the elements and now to kind of exaggerate some of our shapes I want or try to get them to match our reference a little bit more um, I'm going to definitely make these uh, turn off that guy and just make these like a little bit thinner um, which should be good and then I also want to select all of these and kind of bring the shape up a little bit so it feels like more of a thinner claw and then this guy, oops, let's just redo that. I think as I have, um, let's try again. Let's move those up there and then we'll just move these ones this way a bit. Okay, and then we can now rotate this back, something like that. And then the other thing I also wanna do is make this piece um, a bit longer. So I'm gonna just do that and move the claw so just trying as much as possible to get the forms correct at this stage. So you can kind of see here, this is what I'm doing. This guy is definitely like a little bit more thinner as well. So maybe we can scale uh, this area in a bit. So like that. And we'll bring this up a bit too. And then I want to, I want now want to make the claw a bit more chunky. I think I've gone a bit too far with it, so we're just gonna thicken those up. Um, just move this down a little bit there. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely feeling more natural, and it's like it's working better. So, um, yeah. So this, I mean, this is not absolutely perfect in terms of forms and shapes and I would definitely manipulate a few little areas here and there to try to get them to match up closer with our shapes like for example these these are a little bit chunky on the ends and they could definitely come in 
thinner, like the legs of those, you know, if they were more kind of along that line, like along these lines, that's definitely going to work a bit better. So there's proportion changes I would definitely make to tidy this up. But this definitely shows um, a lot of the workflows that I would follow when it comes to blocking out my model. So you're getting those shapes in there. So um, that's uh, pretty much it. So what I'll do now is um, I'll recap everything and then we're going to um, set the homework for the very first um, session here. Hey everyone, so you've reached the end of the very first session. So thank you for um, watching the video. I just wanted to quickly recap everything that we covered in this particular session. And then I'm going to go over uh, the homework assignment for this week. So um, as far as the videos were concerned, we went over our art Bible and how we actually decide upon our ideas and how we actually focus on uh, what we're going to be creating. And then we explore how to expand upon those ideas using reference and uh, gathering different ideas and then uh, finalizing the type of asset we're going to create. And in this case, uh, we settled on our beetle idea. And then we create our final reference board where we uh, figure out all of the different references that we're going to be using to help us with the modeling process. And then I covered the block out portion. So I covered the introduction to Blender and we went through actually blocking out our model and some of the techniques that we would actually use to create the block out model. So as far as the homework assignment is concerned for this week, um, I would definitely encourage you to build out your own art Bibles if you have the time to do that to establish what you want your project to achieve and the things you're hoping to learn. And then you want to build out the reference boards and from there decide upon the idea that you're going to create. It doesn't have to be a beetle if you're you want to do something slightly um, more basic rather than a beetle with less limbs. You can definitely go for that approach or somewhere in the middle or something a little bit more comple complex. So totally up to you how you want to approach it. And then I would expect in this week to basically see a gray box block out. And it doesn't have to be super complicated. You can see here the example I'm showing um, is very, very simple. There's not a lot of crazy geometry to to this. Um, I use a lot of, this, of uh, simple techniques to get those forms and shapes established. Um, so that would be the delivery for this week. So I just wanted to expand a little bit more on deciding upon the idea for the homework uh, submission as well. So um, in the reference gathering portion of the class, we talked about different ideas and how to actually figure out what I wanted to work on, how I went from that process of um, an idea in the art Bible to the reference gathering process um, here and generating my ideas. So I wanted to just give some alternative options. So um, in the class, we focus on the, the beetle. And so I appreciate that for the beetle, this is it's a pretty complex prop that I created and it took me quite a few um, hours to actually finish the model and everything. So if you don't have the time for that and um, you wanted to work on something, I would definitely give the advice of working on maybe one more of the simpler ideas. So I'm going to show a couple of references for the type of thing that I would probably suggest. The reason I uh, picked the beetle was because it had a lot of different techniques that I could demonstrate. So uh, we obviously have uh, legs and wings. And so there's a load of different things I can do with animation and rigging to really show um, all the different techniques and uh, ways that I actually approach that. So that's why I went for something a bit more complex. But if you're doing this for your homework, you might want to pick a slightly more simple example. So um, the ones I picked up in the class were the manta rays and the turtles being a little bit more simple. So I've just pulled out a couple of references here that I wanted to just share with you guys. And in general, I would always advise um, contacting, if you're going to just wholesale use a concept art piece, so if you wanted to pick, say, a particular concept art, I would always um, advise contacting the concept artist and just asking permission um, to use their concept. Usually most concept artists are always really happy to support 3D artists. So it's definitely something that uh, can go a long way. So I definitely would advise that. In this case, um, Tom, he made uh, these submissions for the ArtStation Challenge. So these were actually intended to be recreated in 3D. Um, so yeah, he's a, a super talented um, concept artist. Definitely recommend his work. He's a, a really nice guy as well. Um, so if you scroll down here, um, this Manta drone, I think is a really nice example because it's a simple, it's quite a simple 
uh, design in terms of uh, creating this. You could even approach this with no animation. You can see there's some things underneath that could potentially um, <clears throat> have animation and things. This is supposed to pick up another uh, bot here, another robot. So um, it's more of a drone. But I think this is a really nice example of something a little bit more simple that you could easily achieve with the same techniques in the class. Um, so that one's a, a great example. This is a slightly more complex design. Um, but again, I think this one is great. It's uh, another manta ray based one. Uh, this one has more of like a cockpit or a cab. Um, so yeah, definitely recommend contacting the artist if you're intending to use these concepts as like your wholesale design. But um, I think this one is a great example too. And then if you wanted to go for something a little bit more medium style, um, then I would maybe go for something along the lines of a simple design like a crab. You can see this one has tracks, so it's definitely going to be easier. We don't have to think so much about um, animation as far as like legs are concerned. Um, it has some guns on the front that kind of fold in. So there's a lot less to worry about. The design is a little bit more simple. So again, this one would be a pretty nice, um, easy one to achieve for sure. So um, I think that's a, a, a great example. And again, you can contact the artist directly if you wanted to use that concept. And then this one is more advanced. Um, the design of it is relatively simple, but the animation side of it is definitely pretty tricky you can see these things rolling in but I like the concept I think it's a cool idea um, in this sort of like wasp bee kind of um, idea here and again you could contact the artist um, for this one but I think this is a got a really nice look to it in terms of the design and everything there so that one could be a nice um, if you were going a bit more advanced so yeah you have a couple of options there I would say um, if you're going to go, if this, if it was for me, I probably would go for something more like this crab one because um, it's got some cool options for animation. I like the design and it's simple enough with the tracks and things like that. I think that one is a pretty solid one to pick. So hopefully that helps. And obviously you can always go for the more advanced ones. You can always go for the beetles and things like that. Just be aware that um, in the class... I'm not going to cover every single step of the process and more the techniques that I use. So I just wanted to shout that out in this uh, particular stage. As far as delivery is concerned, um, I would also suggest attaching the Blender file or the and the pure reference file so I can check out any of your images for reference as well as also your models and provide feedback at this stage. Uh, you can provide images if you prefer rather than the files themselves, uh, but it's usually easier for me to provide more in-depth reviews um, if I've got the files themselves. So I just wanted to give that as a heads up as well.